Hey everyone, it's Mark. Welcome to Onyx Training Table. Today I want to debrief uh, an incident that happened just recently um, in uh, Brooklyn Center, uh, Minnesota. And it really is a tragedy. It wasn't an accident. It was a mistake. And there's a difference. And I'm going to talk about that as we go through. Um, first off though, I want to put a disclaimer. I know there is no conspiracy, no overarching agenda by policing to systematically exterminate anybody, okay? Any group of people or anything like that. There isn't. That makes no sense. It's nonsense and it's stupid. Here's the thing. What we are seeing is the um, manifestation of a way of training our police officers, a way of preparing our police officers that is showing itself to be deficient. And I'm using these terms, uh, I'm much more emotional than that about police training and policing, but I'm just trying to stay even with this. We have to realize that the problem isn't that all police are racists or all police are bigots or anything like that. The problem is that we are uh, instilling a mindset of preparation and training in our police officers that does not work for, the, for what we need them to do, okay? That's the problem, is that our training is deficient, our preparation is deficient. Don't let anybody kid you and say that police are the best trained we could possibly be right now. If that's the case, then we're all done. I train, I've been training for 25 years. The way I train is not the way the majority of policing is trained today, it's not. So, I want to talk about this situation, this tragedy, this tragedy that happened in Brooklyn Center. Now, police officers uh, conducted a traffic stop on uh, Dante Wright, all right? Now, here's the thing. Whatever the reason, the probable cause for their traffic stop, it's the probable cause that I never, ever used as a police officer. I can't see your tag or your plate or you have air freshener hanging from your windshield your tint is too dark, all that kind of stuff. My thing is, if you're gonna pull somebody over for probable cause, make a good probable cause. That makes your situation strong. Is it, then that helps in your decision making, that helps in your confidence. If you're doing things flimsy, then you're not very confident because you don't know where to take things. So they pull him over, they find he has a warrant. Okay, great, that's fantastic. Now we're gonna arrest him. Here's the problem that they didn't have. They didn't have any team teamwork, team configuration, and uh, I want to talk about, a little bit about training muscle memory, okay? So, and because it all, it's all together, it's all interrelated. So, they go to arrest him, you go to place him in handcuffs. Where do they place him in handcuffs? If you look in the video, standing by, near, right by his front door of his car. So, what are they continuing to allow him? from his perception, an avenue of escape. Now, here's where we got to get away from blaming the suspect. We're talking about people, in this case, who have an outstanding warrant for their arrest. He doesn't follow the rules. He doesn't hold himself accountable. He doesn't want to be held accountable by anybody else. He doesn't make good decisions. So why are we blaming the suspect when we know, by all evidence, that they don't make good decisions? Therefore, we, the police officers, the trained professionals, need to make the decisions for the people. And by that, I mean this. When we're taking him into custody, remove his avenue of escape or his perceived avenue of escape. Now, some of you may think, well, then you give him the whole street to run down. Fine. He can run down the street. It's a lot less dangerous than him jumping in a car. We talk about how dangerous a car is and how we shoot people because they're in cars and we're afraid they're going to hit us. But then we leave him an avenue of escape into his car. If he wants to run down the street, I don't care. Run down the street. He's going to get tired. We have cars. We'll chase him. A foot chase is a lot easier than a car chase. So, team configuration. I'm the primary. I'm taking it in the custody. My partner should see that and position themselves, move us away from the car door, and go, I'm going to take away this, the most obvious avenue of escape. That's his safety, that's his route of escape, right? The third officer 
She could have been the less lethal op operator, which she thought she was, but prepare yourself. Don't wait until the crisis. It's too late. Prepare yourself. Get your taser out right now. Have it ready to go. And at the first, because a less lethal tool is used to regain compliance when somebody is non-compliant. But we don't want to wait until there's a physical fight. It's too late. We want that person to, when we perceive that non-compliance, we want to give them direction. And if they don't follow it, we use that less lethal. Okay? That's why it's there. It's not right below lethal. It's well below lethal. Okay? So, if they do that, they move away from the door. He doesn't try to get back in the car. If she has her taser out, she knows she has her taser out. If you look at the video, she's trying to get in and she's got her gun out. Where is her mind? It's not thinking because if she was thinking, if she was observing, she would have noticed that that wasn't yellow and black. It was just black. She would have known that she didn't have her taser out. So when everything's calm, get your tool out and get ready. Don't wait until it's panic time and then try to get it out. So muscle memory. Why did she pull the, the gun? She's a 25 year veteran. Why did she pull the gun rather than the taser? Well, it's simple. 25 years. How many times did she pull her gun as opposed to her taser? Muscle memory in a crisis situation. You will not rise to the level of the occasion. You will sink to the level of your training. So she pulls the, her gun out, not even thinking, doesn't pay attention that it's a gun, never checks that it's a gun over a taser to confirm because she's already in the crisis situation. Prepare yourself before the crisis because you're not going to be ready to go when the crisis happens. OODA loop. Who is ahead in the OODA loop? Suspect. He doesn't have to think about anything other than trying to get away. The officers have to observe that, orient themselves to what they want to do, decide what they're going to do, and then do it. Now, we all talk about split-second decision and rapidly changing environment. That's the rapidly changing environment. Once the suspect decides to do something physical, they've created the rapidly changing environment. Prior to that, if you notice, they're all just standing around and everybody's just standing there. That's the time we prepare. That's the time we make decisions. They don't have to be split second. We have time. We can look at things, check things out. Oh, the car door, he's right by it. Let me move over here and stand in between it. Let me close the front, the, the car door. He's not getting back in it. It doesn't need to be open. Right? It's just that those preparations need to be made continually. We have to constantly be assessing the situation and seeing what should I be doing now? What about now? What about now? What's the worst case scenario? And how can I keep that from happening? These are questions we should be asking ourselves all the time, continuously. Okay? Because then we don't have to make split second decisions in a rapidly changing environment. That's when we do things like that. So when you see all these police chiefs saying, well, you have to understand, police officers make split-second decisions to rapidly change environment because they aren't preparing ahead of time. Because they're allowing themselves to be controlled by the situation. They're allowing themselves to constantly be behind the eight ball. And that's nowhere to be. So change. Think about it. Prepare. Question all the time, continuously. You should be asking yourself questions. What's the worst case scenario here? And can I accept those consequences? If not, change it. That's what I told my kids growing up their entire childhood. You have to think about what's the worst case scenario and are you willing to accept those consequences? If you are, fine, go ahead and do it. If not, do something else. We need to improve our training for our police officers. One, so that they don't get killed and injured. And two, so that they don't kill and injure the wrong person. Okay? Our communities are depending on us. We need to be better. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time on the training table.